Welcome to the first panel of the afternoon. I'm very happy to have Gerrit K. Sharma here. He works as a sound artist and composer and holds a diploma in media arts from the University of Media Arts in Cologne and a master in composition and computer music from the University of Music and Performance Arts in Graz. There he graduated with an artistic PhD. He is a winner of the Deutsche Klangkunstpreis and the Kargesheimer Media Arts Grant and received several scholarships. In winter semester 2017-18, he was appointed Edgar Varese, guest professor at the Technical University of Berlin. For the past three years, he has been senior artist researcher within the peak funded project Orchestrating Space by Ecohesitral Loudspeaker. And that's what he is going to talk about, um, about his experiences with the loudspeaker in a yeah, four-year research project. Welcome. Well, thank Garrett. you very much for having me. Uh, yeah, hello everyone. Um, trying to get acquainted to the situation here a little bit. Um, so, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a more or less brief uh, overview of what we did within the past four years within the PIG project, but also about actually an artistic research uh, exploration from the past ten years. Um, so our, our four-year project is running out now within the next weeks, so that's actually uh, kind of uh, cleaning up uh, and uh, putting uh, some pieces together. And um, so when um, uh, Michael asked uh, uh, whether we could uh, give a short talk, uh, we said yes, of course, because we have to um, uh, wrap up. And that's always, a g uh, again, a good uh, uh, occasion. Uh, I'm twofold, so to speak. I'm uh, uh, only two for today because uh, I'm also here for Frank Schulz, a uh, dear colleague and uh, great friend uh, who was working on the project as well, but as it goes uh, in our days. Now he's for six years in Rostock again, and uh, uh, but he was, a <coughs> he was a very strong influence on the project uh, I'm going to talk about, and I'm going to talk about the other guys, uh, brilliant minds, that I was <coughs> uh, uh, honored to work with uh, in a couple of minutes. So, um, before we're going to see this uh, odd slideshow, uh, I would like to take a moment with you and get acquainted to the acoustic situation here, because you're listening to my voice from very strange uh, loudspeakers over there, and it's supposed to be human, human voice. Uh, but actually, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, uh, this guy. And for that, I chose uh, um, a situation that uh <coughs> is working together with this and this ugly-sounding machine over your head. That's actually uh, an instrument in itself. Uh, and the proof that audiovisual uh, media installation mostly don't work. <laughs> uh, because, yeah because of this. Uh, so I had to um, choose a completely different situation. Uh, I want you to see this, and uh, when I put it in the center, you have a slight problem with that. So uh, I chose for my um, lecture a smaller like chamber orchestra-like situation over there, and that's actually where I'm going to uh, project the sound to. And uh, for the installation afterwards, that's running until 6 o'clock, I will rearrange and put this into the center and play more power with a little more volume to use uh, the rest of the architecture more. So um, <coughs> if you would please be so kind and give me two minutes and just try to uh, figure out um, how to uh, erase this object above your heads from the other information that you get from uh, the architecture and uh, the only loudspeaker that is working there. And um, maybe you want to uh, close your eyes so that you get a little bit rid of um, ugly graphics.
So <coughs> thank you very much for the concentration. Um, I like to talk about a little bit about how it came to uh, this project and the background uh, of uh, our efforts from the past years. So uh, it's my uh, part of my personal history and the history of the members of the group that uh, we were working with all kinds of um, uh, sound uh, projections within the past 15 years. This is a photograph, I guess, from 2005 uh, at, the, at Ilmenau uh, in Germany. And um, uh, nobody was actually, uh, or not a lot of people were actually using this kind of system uh, artistically at the time. Um, <coughs> and we were invited, uh, still when I was at the Academy of Media Arts in Cologne, to try, and we tried extensively. And funny enough, 10 years later, so we're talking 2015, this was uh, placed at the Transmediale in Berlin as the sound system of the future, 10 years later. And they were still using the same wording and PR uh, texts uh, that they were using 10 years before. So. Um, I'm not saying that because uh, I want to show that we are always working or have to work with the newest chip, sorry, uh, but to say uh, that uh, every every apparatus we're working with has its own myths and uh, uh, it's always a kind of pendulum between artistic practice and engineering practice and what both sides, sometimes they are really sides, opposite sides, uh, believe what their systems can do and what they actually do. And they come up with very, very different results. Um, so um, next step would be uh, working with Ambisonics and Housefear. That was um, for me um, 2009. And since then, I uh, quite often uh, worked with uh, this kind of uh, setup. So loudspeaker Housefears, but also loudspeaker rings, of course. Um, and all kinds of uh, special situations. Here, for example, you have the ZKM in Karlsruhe, where you uh, seem to have uh, the same situation, but it's com of course, uh, sounds completely different. And uh, it's always the question uh, um, what uh, the people who are building this kind of systems and the people who are using it uh, think what uh, they can do with that and uh, what are the basics of um, these um, beliefs. So uh, if we test this system with, let's say, white noise um, uh, and see if, a, if it can per uh, circle a sound perfectly, it will be completely different if you take any kind of other sound that uh, an artist maybe would uh, like to try out. So um, it's all always very different, coming to different sy uh, systems, uh, working with dif different uh, uh, environments. And uh, of course, uh, in the same year, um, there was uh, 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 lots of uh, testing going on at IEM at the time in Graz, and this was a prototype from about 2007. And um, uh, so working with all these systems before, I, I, I stumbled in a, in a demonstration actually in, uh, in, in this space uh, um, of, uh, so to speak, the forefather of uh, this guy. And, um, and uh, there was uh, a very interesting uh, demonstration, but it was never meant to work in any kind of electronic music. This is actually a, a reproductive device for a holographic sound. So I'm going to show you some graphics later, but Franz Sotter uh, was thinking about uh, recording three-dimensional um, 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 yeah, uh, radiation patterns of solo uh, instrumentalists. And then the question was, how can I reproduce this uh, with, a, uh, with a, a loudspeaker system so that you have a kind of perfect holographic representation of uh, um, a single uh, instrumentalist. And uh, that was one of the solutions. And uh, of course, I was not interested in that, uh, because why should I reproduce uh, a violin? That's completely senseless. Um, of course, <laughs> but you can go to a concert. Um, but uh, I, I, I walked to France, and I told him, uh, come on, um, 
are, are you aware? I mean, of course he was because he was working uh, uh, in the States for a while and, and there were similar models, but are you aware that we could use this for our electroacoustic music or installation? And he said, yeah, well, of course, well, let's try. At that time, that was a very, very stupid idea because we were talking about amplification towers like that, computers like that, and this is actually quite bigger than this one. Uh, it doesn't look like. So there were lots of problems coming up. So if you're hearing me saying, why should I reproduce a violin that is stupid, uh, this is not very, it's not meant arrogantly. It's just from where I'm coming from. And if you talk about electroacoustic composition and sound art, uh, for me, it's only parts of it, but we all talk about uh, technical means to record and reproduce, of course, are also composed in a way of synthesized sounds and use loudspeakers, tools, and instruments. That's, this is actually a cultural, very, very <laughs> important dis uh, distinction. Uh, most of the, uh, the engineering society of our society would say we use, of course, loudspeakers for the reproduction of something that we produced or recorded somewhere else. Uh, where and lots of composers actually would say the same. This is actually very sad. But um, a lot of other people, and I would count myself to that, uh, and there's a long tradition, let's say at least 80, 90 years of uh, heavy work in this field, would say, no, we use loudspeakers as instruments. Uh, so uh, there's a huge debate on this, and uh, I published with Frank Schulz a paper on that, two years ago at a conference, and we were surrounded by people that were really hating us. How can you say a loudspeaker is a musical instrument? That's stupid. Um, um, I was actually astounded by the reaction. Loudspeaker as a mediator between um, 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 yeah, the digital and the analog, that's until we are not able to put the uh, signals into our um, cortex, we always uh, have to transform something uh, at least with our ears, and this means that it's not only a technical or mathematical procedure, this is actually a social act. And uh, this is uh, what I mean. Uh, there are a lot of beliefs in one space what a loudspeaker actually is doing, although everyone is listening to the same stuff. Um, and of course, for my field specialization, so I work and we work with uh, space and concepts of space a lot. Uh, something that was always there, of course, but you wouldn't uh, believe that, uh, well maybe you know, but uh, that 100 years ago, ago uh, yeah, uh, space in music was actually not something that people try to compose. Maybe intuitively, but not as a field or a parameter, maybe like rhythm or melody. Yeah, but it ca a space and uh, therefore uh, the technique of arranging uh, spatial entities in music is not so old. Um, but I show you something, and I'm, I, I'm, I, it's only one quote that I uh, show you, and, uh, uh, and I briefly go through it. I know it's too much, but um, <laughs> when new instruments will allow me to write music, as I conceive it, the movement of sound masses of shining planes will be clearly perceived. So there's a guy in the world who says that uh, he can move sound masses and he can create planes of sound and he can take these sound masses and oh, well, moment there's something like ah look masses and can let them collide yeah um, and he's uh, actually talking about a fourth dimension in music uh, and he's calling it sound projection and he's talking about uh, composition and listening to music as a journey into the space. And he says, today, with the technical means that exist and are easily adaptable, the differentiation of various masses, again, and the planes will, as these beams of sound could be made discernible for the listener. Uh, uh, so he's talking about uh, the possibility for a composer to actually form sculptural, like, where if, you, if you try to picture this, uh, uh, you have sculptural entities, uh, so planes and masses and colliding entities and beams, and he's quite convinced that uh, it's not only in his mind, but uh, he can actually give this to an audience, yeah, 
and other people will perceive this. This is very interesting <coughs> because, as you know, um, uh, perception is very, very personal. And uh, as a composer, especially in the media arts of today, uh, you're and working in the studio, I think a lot of people of you know that, you work on something very hard for a very, very, very long time. And the hardest moment is the first time someone else enters the, the room and then you try to show. And uh, you sometimes feel that it's a complete different piece. Or it's only someone entering the space. And then everything can change. So he's talking about these zones of intensities for a concert situation uh, that would mean you have a concert hall and there are several um, sound masses that you can really almost touch and they can collide and they, they can really be uh, differenti uh, different differentiated. Um, so this non-blending yeah, of entities of sound, and this is very odd for some people to, to read this, especially if you think about the year this was set, today with the technical means that exist. So uh, I call this the utopia and the founding myth of uh, spatial music. Um, because someone is talking about uh, long before uh, he was actually, uh, Edgar Varese was actually able to go to the studio and produce uh, electronically because. Uh, uh, it was 20 years uh, later that um, he composed the electronic uh, uh, poem Electronique. But he was so convinced that with the technical stuff around him, he was able to uh, more or less sculpture sound. Um, and from this moment on, engineers and musicians were kind of, um, well, first of all, motivated, but uh, at the same time, uh, uh, yeah, doing say uh, very very weird experiments to make make this happen. Yeah, to it's the first time that we really. I mean, there are other uh, cases in history, but it's so clear that someone believes that spatial uh, sound can be sculptured uh, with um, technical means. And uh, since then, we are actually working on that. But um, it's interesting to show this that way around because this is actually why people like me and people like you are sitting in these loudspeaker environments and are wondering uh, what can be done uh, uh, spatially with sound. Um, but at the same time, you find uh, in um, Mr. Rhodes' book from 2015, uh, indeed the art of specialization has emerged as one of the m most important topics in composition today, but even though um, we lack uh, a theory and uh, kind of uh, language, uh, how we actually describe this. And this is very crucial. So working with media technology nowadays, if you don't reproduce a violin, which is perfectly all right, <laughs> but what happens if you can't say it's a violin anymore? How do you describe Uh, let's take something that you already had. So um, we don't have words, and we don't have scores, and uh, looking at spectrograms won't help. So if you work with that, and if you start combining this, some of you might do this with uh, not pictures of cars or whatever, birds, water, but with light or color, so other spectra. How do we actually talk about it? How do we communicate about it? How do we actually get into uh, the same state that uh, creative people have been for hundreds of years when they were able to say, uh, okay, uh, this is a sound called cat. 
Um, it was actually it's a it's a problem that e Stockhausen in the 70s addressed. He said we have only a, f a very very limited uh, vocabulary to describe sound. We always say it's an oboe, but it's not enough. It never was. But especially today, to say okay, it's a guitar. It's only talking about we're talking about the source, but not about the entity uh, that's actually. Um, um, Hearable. So um, we have a problem here, and that's because we have two different kind of uh, languages working at the same time. Um, we have two opposite cultures. We have the exact sciences that we need to construct something like that, calculate that, and uh, especially in acoustics, informatics, engineering, and they um, have to define conditions very precisely. Yeah, and uh, otherwise. This is actually not doing anything. I'm not saying it's working because it's perfectly calculated. We have lots of examples that something is perfectly calculated, not doing what it should. Um, on the other side, we have the culture of music appreciation. So we have uh, an audience uh, and we have uh, musicians using these machines and they misuse it most of the time. Uh, there's, uh, if you look at uh, the way you're maybe using uh, um, a guitar at home, or you're using your laptop, it's not necessarily the way it was intended that you really use it. You find your way for your instrument, and uh, you call this individuality in a way. Some. Um, so, scientific discourse seeks to eliminate ambiguity, uh, so everything has to be precisely as we, s we talk about, whereas, of course, artistic discourse is... Uh, will seek to be as polyvalent as possible. So we, we're talking about uh, something that we produce by describing all kinds of possibilities, what it might be. And these two worlds actually have to come together if you want to produce something like that, if you come up with the idea that it's not only reproducing something that we have in the world already, like a violin. Um, so the question is, what does the composer or a creative, creative person know about the per perceptive cap capabilities of the audience? Uh, what do I know about how you or you or you in different position in the space perceive something that's coming from there? Or is it really coming from there? I mean, you couldn't prove. I mean, from the experience you have. You have to step up, you have to put your hand there. It has to come from there because you see it. But are you sure? Maybe they are more loud speakers. So what, what do we know about the perceptive qualities and capabilities? Um, and for that, uh, Ozil, so the project uh, I was uh, honored to work with, um, defined something for ourselves that we call the shared perceptual space, the SPS. So that's a common space of perceptions, because there are always plenty of 3D sound phenomena. Um, to explain this uh, a little bit better, if you take uh, guys who are able, yeah, scientists, to, bu to build this yeah, and to calculate this, yeah, and they sit together and they listen to this device, yeah, uh, they probably have, in my experience, always have a completely different way of talking about what they're experiencing and actually they experience completely different from what I hear. I give you a good example. When I was in the first presentation of this, I was explained, okay, we now uh, we, we use beamforming, so we uh, are able to produce a very, very narrow uh, uh, sound beam, and we take white noise and we let circle it uh, at the equator, uh, uh, equator and uh, so we produce a very strong um, phantom uh, sources, if you want to call them like that, on surfaces, and by that, I will play you something like that later, but just listen to it. Uh, uh, and by that, we can actually uh, uh, produce a rotation and so on. And we will um, now play this uh, clockwise. And there were at least eight engineers standing at IEM together around this thing. First of all, why standing around it when there's a beam uh, heading outside? Be because you're so sure that the math is right, why should you really care? I'm not saying this in a bad way. I love the situation. 
uh, um, we all laugh about it uh, uh, since then. And I was standing there and said, okay, uh, maybe I'm, too ex uh, I'm not experienced enough. Maybe I'm too young. <laughs> maybe I've, but it's not for me, it's not clockwise, it's counterclockwise. Yeah. Uh, but everyone was sure uh, it was kind of running this way, the beam. And I was standing there, and, and for me, it was the other way around. I just couldn't believe it. Oh, what can I do? And um, so a couple of years later, I went to the guy who uh, did the algorithm at the time and said, there's one thing um, uh, I never dared to talk about. I was so sure that it was uh, clockwise, and I, I listened to it, and I said, yes, yeah. Uh, uh, I, I found out later that, uh, that uh, there was a, um, something wrong with the code, but uh, yes, you're right. I mean, it should, but it should have run the other way around. But everyone was so sure it was running counterclockwise. Yeah, because we said so. You know the phenomena with loudspeakers that are not switched on and off and all this in the studio, all these things are happening. So I'm not ta talking to you in a, uh, as if I want to say this is all bad. I just want to talk about other sensibilities that we need if we want to go further with that. So in comics, if I'm sitting in a room and I'm producing something, like in a studio, let's say with the eco, and I have kind of very strange sound masses and uh, objects like crickles and planes and whatever the race was talking about. Um, and this is me. The next question would be, uh, uh, if you go there, do you have similar experiences? Or is it just a blur? Are we just talking about nonsense? Or is it just, should I didn't, should I, shouldn't I care that we can share something? Should I say, okay, I produce my shit and what you're making out of it is your problem? Um, for me and for Ozil, it was very important that we actually understand are we could we actually talk about very similar entities, about things that are appear, uh, um, uh, appearing in our uh, perception and not only saying, oh, it's more left or it's more right, but really mo more, uh, let's talk about more about three-dimensional objects. But if it changes so drastically, uh, with lots of people, uh, why should we care? Yeah. What is, what what then is diffusion in music or loudspeaker music about? Um, so the idea was actually to do research in this field. If we could understand the percep uh, the perception of more people better using the eco uh, and its capabilities. To actually. Uh, talk later on about something that we might call a shared perceptual space. Um, okay, that's very um, uh, theoretically for some of you maybe, but uh, this perceptual something is actually uh, the question uh, was was the question we were talking about all the time for the last four years, uh, and we were sitting in endless uh, situations together uh, in the studio and. Uh, asking questions and trying material and trying to understand how uh, how architecture, how like like this build here, how uh, loudspeaker projection and our perception uh, uh, are working together or not. Failure uh, is a great teacher, by the way. Um, so here's you, you see the first sketches. That's very long uh, ago. So where Franz Sutter himself encaged himself with his guitar and there was also a violin player and so and had this array of uh, microphones of course here in every joint and the question was how can we how can we reproduce what we would hear uh, listening to Franz Sutter playing guitar and the idea was of course uh, uh, a little bit complicated and uh, you can see it was the first uh, visualizations of uh, how uh, or how this could work, and the idea was actually to use beamforming, um, and uh, yeah, and of course uh, reflective uh, surfaces um, at the time. Um, 
so we are actually able to uh, produce something like um, very narrow sound beams, and by that we um, we can produce these uh, movements and all kinds of uh, um, fields. And I play you something very simple. Um, find it for yourself um, and try to eliminate the beamer. So it's probably the one of the first tests that we ever did, uh, taking a beam on a very slow rotation. And of course, you don't have a perfect circle here. I mean, how could we do this? Because you only have reflections there, then morph somewhere there, you lose it there. Somewhere there, you get some side effects, and then strong there again. But I think you get the idea uh, what, what people were talking about for couple of years, but uh, if you slow, uh, this was very slow, if you speed this up, same signal, same rotation. So I only speed up, up <coughs> uh, I only increase the speed, and you have a completely different morph. Yeah, you m some of you might have heard something like rhythmic uh, pattern inside, like that was not there before. We call this um, spatial beating in our uh, language. And uh, so we were doing all these tests, and okay, on the screen it's a circle, <laughs> yeah. but in the perception it makes completely different artifacts. So how do we describe them that we can work with them? And if you take, for example, something <laughs> like that. That's only, t this, uh, only two beams, the same beams, counterclockwise same rotation, but the effect is completely different. So how do we describe this? How do we get something instrumental out of this? How do we understand this better? And this is only uh, with broadband signals like noise here. Uh, so, um, for example, if you take something like that, Yeah, you have grainy, transient-like material, and uh, with the the same rotation of the of the broadband signal in the background, so you have kind of death gradation. Yeah, you have uh, sculpt uh, sculptural qualities with very very simple signals, yeah? and the idea was how can we build on up all these experiencing now towards something that we call uh, would call more artistically or or uh, music or whatever. Um, something is missing here. Uh, of course, there's a history before that. One of the first was uh, Lars Fell in the, in the 90s, that was at IRCAM. There's uh, 2006 is the ECO, but there's also uh, in the States uh, and uh, I think in Aachen as well, uh, there, there were people uh, working on uh, similar concepts, but um, 
it was actually the IEM and uh, the PEAK project uh, in 2000 uh, and <coughs> maybe it was 14 that uh, was able to go deeper into detail here. So, um, what we're talking about today is uh, the Eco Sonable. Uh, Sonable is uh, a startup from former students uh, model that's new, kind of new, and uh, is can be uh, can be bought nowadays. The first one was sold to Newcastle this uh, this summer, and there are other uh, universities uh, considering buying it. And actually, I was told that Nike wanted to have 30, 30 of these for the states but I don't know what happened to the project. Um, so it's, uh, it's not only talking about uh, musical theory here and trying something out in the lab. This is actually, uh, this became a product. And um, so uh, what we have is we have tw uh, 20 loudspeakers on one entity. We, uh, we use ambisonics in the third order beam. And uh, we meanwhile have our own free uh, plugins, the Ambix plugins by... Um, um, Matthias Kronlachner are kind of, uh, well, you can freely download them. And uh, you may know that we have the IEM plugins now that are quite helpful. Um, they're all free for Ambisonics uh, nowadays. And uh, to make this uh, as democratic as po uh, possible, we said, okay, we are using a, a DAW, um, and everyone can adapt to this uh, if he or she uh, likes or use something else. But um, everything is... Uh, kind of uh, free and uh, available. Um, so all kinds, uh, I have a colleague did this, I have nice here. So this is actually what's going on there. We're using reflections and we let rotate and uh, we use sta static beams at the same time. Okay, so that's background. But what did we do then? Um, first of all, the questions were, can we reproduce what we have in the studio? Can we produce something like a theory on composition? Um, and what can we learn about, uh, about the instrumentality of an object that was never used like that before? Yeah? Or is anything that's happening there only in my head working in the studio and once I come to you or other people or I give this away, uh, it's actually uh, there's no match of perception at all. Um, a couple of years ago, I would have said quite likely, not there, you can't share this experience, but uh, because of the project, the peak project we are working in uh, for a couple of years now, I, I'm thinking very differently. Um, and this actually matches with what I call the basic research question in Sonic 3D environments. Uh, it's always a question working with any kind of 3D uh, tool. Uh, can we derive a compositional method, or are we just uh, using the same ideas that we're using since the 60s, like working in the studio, working with the same mixing consoles, with the same knobs, faders, or can we get some somewhere else? Can we get another idea of tools, instrumentality, and how can we bring them into methods? Um, how can we verbalize this? Uh, that's the Stockhausen quote that I mentioned only uh, briefly before. We, uh, what are terms that we can work with? Yeah, uh, like everyone that we can agree on that this is happening. Not only saying it sounds like a guitar. It's not enough. If you want to achieve more precise compositional ideas, and uh, then again, how can we bring this on stage? Yeah. How uh, can we make them available to a bigger audience? And um, uh, what do we have to consider if we come into different places uh, like this hall or the hall over there or play uh, in a club? Is it possible to play with this in a club, for example? Is this possible to use this with a beamer over there? Um, this is, seems to be a very, the last thing seems to be a very, very uh, simple question, but um, it would, the, one of the answers could be that uh, this is working only for some spaces and not working, for example, with this together, or it would mean that you can't play any kind of music uh, 
with, with this device. And this is actually anti-marketing. And this is the most brutal result that you can come up with today. Something that is not very good for marketing. Because we tend to say, although most of us know it's not true, we tend to say a good loudspeaker should be able to play most of the music. Yes, if you consider it as a tool, like mo a lot of composers do, not not too many anymore, but like it's like a, a tube for some. Yeah, you put some water in, and you get the same water out. Well, this is not what we are what we were researching. Um, but of course, uh, it's an argument. So. Um, that was actually what we were doing uh, within the past years. So we were four engineers, one composer, two supervisors like Robert Heldrich from IEM. And um, uh, I just added this here because if you want to get more information, there's lots. Uh, we have uh, 22 publications and there have been lots of documented concerts and in the end two PhDs working on this project. And uh, so... Um, if you want to get deeper into, into the technical aspects and uh, other artistic aspects, uh, there's plenty to study and uh, uh, to find. So uh, talking about a uh, research routine here, so what we always did, we always started with kind of what we called miniatures, yeah? miniaturen. And then we were uh, bringing people together and uh, conducted listening tests. And then we analyzed this. Uh, for example, um, what I was playing to you, um, we were asking people, where do you hear this? How would you describe this? Uh, do you, and well, they, we have very strict routines. I'm going to show you later on pictures. Just to get as much as information from listeners, not only from our own experiences. And uh, we analyzed that, and then the reflective part was very interesting. Of course, we had to conceptualize, uh, uh, for example, what kind of sounds are uh, or seem to be better for beaming and for uh, phantom sources, and what kind of sounds like uh, transient uh, crackles uh, or um, bursts uh, are actually uh, not very good for, uh, for distance. Uh, and uh, thro or throwing them into the space, uh, a colleague always said, uh, and uh, what kind of sounds are seem to uh, glue more to the surface, and how do we uh, use this uh, in, in a creative way. Um, and this, again, uh, was then, uh, you, you, you analyze this, and then you come up with more complex uh, uh, structures that we could call it as we called them etudes uh, or etuden. I play you one where you can now uh, hear some uh, elements uh, put together in a, what we call three-dimensional sculptural form. That would be something like that. So that what um, and we had lots of them. So I think we were researching with uh, over 60 miniatures and uh, 40 etudes, and they were all then always coming through the same routine, like listening test analyst analysis, and then put together into uh, into musical pieces. And they all had to go and I'll show you pictures then uh, into concert practice. So everything was then uh, not only. Uh, in the studio uh, analysis process and uh, reflective um, 
conceptualization, but always had to be in a concept situation in the end. Okay. And um, so what we came up in the end is, and that's uh, no, I skip this. This is five minutes. So um, what we come up in the end is um, sculpturality. Uh, so we one back. We because the descriptions of many composers in the past were always more or less talking about sculpturality. We researched uh, what actually sculpture means. So you, you you can read this in the media. Yeah, people are talking about uh, uh, sculptural sounds, uh, sculpturality of projection systems, and all this. And we were actually able to um, to uh, build models uh, in three D audio that are um, in this listening uh, test that uh, are actually matching kind of the um, forms that have been uh, developed in in uh, in sculptural uh, uh, so in the in the in the fine arts, and so we were actually building models in 3D audio that were matching kind of the kernel plastic uh, and special uh, the spatial plastic. So different kind of some people would talk about gestures here. I I don't like this, but uh, about Sculptural formations that were used in uh, in the fine arts for hundreds of years, and seem to be uh, in a way experienceable in 3D audio. If, of course, you want to compose like that, this is only one way. But then we would have a scheme that we could talk about. So all kinds of uh, so I there are lots of listening exp uh, examples for that. But of course, in the end you would have a scheme where you could say, okay, you maybe have a, p uh, a piece that is uh, uh, matching one uh, uh, body space relation, as we call them, uh, in the beginning and then developing towards other plastic principles. And by that, we were able to describe actually uh, uh, a piece, uh, a sculptural piece with all its entities over time, but not talking about left or right, background, foreground, or we were actually able to talk about uh, spatial entities in a musical piece uh, by using these terms that we developed uh, in, uh, derived from uh, the fine arts, but in the end, we're able to reproduce and produce in listening experiments in the studio and, of course, on stage later on. Um, so there are lots of papers on that. I'll skip you that. This is kind of the studio situation, so that you get a feeling how we uh, how we did this. So people were sitting on. Forget about these two loudspeakers here. That's they were actually not there, <laughs> but uh, people were had touch screens and uh, were and we and were actually evaluating um, what we were doing. And by that, we slowly over the years came up with the terminology we're using today. Um, da, 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 I skip you all this. Maybe we find a nice picture. See, there's lots of other stuff. Yeah. Um, so in the end, what we did, and this is actually where we, uh, what we came up with, because it was not, the project was not about finding nice uh, new words for something that is actually uh, developing so fast that you probably tomorrow need something different, but uh, the idea was that you uh, are able to take uh, the idea of instrumentality, so how to use loudspeaker arrays as musical instruments and not sheer reproductive tools. Also, of course, you're rep reproducing something always, that's for sure, and um, bring them in a concert situation and learn how to play with um, all these uh, factors that you have to keep in mind. And actually, by this, um, get information for the for the uh, for the process of composition. So that actually, I I can think of every stage of composition, like how do I form an idea, how do I verbalize this, how do I communicate it, how do I bring this on stage, what works on stage, what is not working on stage, how can I actually 
work on the piece uh, in a concert situation that it sounds better or where, when do I have to say, this is not working with the speaker. It's probably not working at all. So that was actually all we were uh, working on. And uh, I see that's uh, two-thirds of my uh, foils, but I, it's a nice picture. So let's uh, stop with that. Um, I'm going to set up uh, in a couple of minutes an installation here. Completely different setup then without this. And there's going to be a, a kind of loop, 17, almost 20 minutes loop. But then there's a little bit silence and starts again uh, until 6 o'clock. So uh, all this talking is not worth anything until or unless you make some experiences. So uh, feel invited to, uh, to come back, um, sit on the nice sound uh, lounge chairs and uh, listen to some stuff. Thank you. Thank you very much, Long Gerrit, time. and I think people are very curious to listen to what this was all about. Um, Is there time for questions or, or no Yes, questions? We, we have time for questions. I would, would just like to announce that um, we will finish our talks at uh, around 7.30, 7.40ish. So there's 20 more minutes if you want to listen to all the lectures on the other side. Um, to um, have some extra time uh, where there's no kind of um, comp competing, competitive um, um, lecture. But of course, you are very free to stay here and uh, or to take your time whenever you want and to listen um, to the interesting uh, material Garrett is going to play. There's time for one or two questions. Uh, are there any? It's very difficult to see actually here. So perhaps you scream or do something because <laughs> it's impossible to see anything. <laughs> yes. Um, last time I looked, it's a couple of weeks ago, uh, it was about, um, I with the um, amplification, it's 30,000. So... If you know a little bit about instruments, instruments and loudspeakers, it's absolutely not expensive. So the, there's, um, I mean, you can have a look later, but I mean, I was, I was traveling with loudspeaker ampl amplification tower like that for years, and now it's zwei uh, Höheneinheiten, uh, no? Yeah, or yeah. So uh, and it's a 24-channel loud uh, um, ampli amplification. So um, you get four for free, so to speak. Uh, can do other stuff, or you can, of course, use it for other other uh, uh, setups like half spheres or whatever. So um, yeah, it's it's about thirty. Okay. Okay, I think yes. One last question. Um, it's, uh, it's a very, very nice question. Um, um, because there are several different setup possibilities, and um, I used, I, I tried lots. Uh, for example, here, visually, you would put this in the center underneath this nice thing and all this away, and, uh, but acoustically, it's a nightmare. Uh, because you need reflections, and if you put it there, it's the worst. I mean, in the center, it's the worst, worst thing you could do. But that wouldn't mean, answering your question more uh, straight, um, that I prefer. Uh, it depends on, on the piece you want to play, on the music you want to reproduce or produce. Um, uh, Within the past two or three years, I preferred uh, the centralized. Like, you will see this later. There's one in the center and then two and two. Or you can do this, uh, yeah, with seven. I, I brought uh, five of these. So that you can actually um, uh, give a, a, a produce a wide screen. This is 
the easiest way to do it. And also because we are so used of this panoramic listening. I mean, actually, this is what we are very good in. Um, uh, but uh, it, uh, I, did, I did, for example, a, a lecture a couple of years ago in Berlin at Haus der Kultur in der Welt, and it was a very similar situation. I was standing in front, there was the beamer there, but it was impossible to put the eco somewhere, so I put the eco in the corner over there, behind the audience. And there was, very uh, very s um, there was a corner with uh, lots of glass and concrete, so I had very, very strong reflections. Uh, I was able to play at least the, the, um, the examples uh, from behind the audience. It's this is another very, very uh, strange field that I would like to do in my next project, but um, how visuality actually acts on, uh, on our uh, listening experience. Because, uh, of course, it's different if you put the loudspeaker behind the audience, and there, but with very hard reflective surfaces, you can actually produce something that, without knowing that the speaker is there, the audience would actually not question. This is a very good last word for today. <laughs> we will continue in the small assembly hall with the next um, lecture by Friedrich Blutner, which will be in German. Um, thank you again, Gerrit, and uh, feel yeah, welcome. Thank you. Feel welcome to listen to the Ecoseida whenever you have some spare time.